Good afternoon, or good evening. Greetings of, greetings of the day, wherever you're dialing from. Today we'll be hosting Mike uh, Saunderson for a talk on managing safety in tunneling. But before we hand over to Mike, um, I have got a quick introduction uh, for IC London Graduate Students Committee, who are one of our partners in today's events. So IC London Graduate Students Committee is formed of non-chartered members of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and its aim is to predominantly support the professional development of the non-chartered members so that they achieve academic qualifications. The ICGNS, therefore, um, carries out uh, support activities in the form of organizing lectures uh, like this one, site visits, uh, but also carry out IC London Region's uh, STEM outreach. You can find more inf information about the IC London Graduate and Students Committee on uh, IC's website or on the sorry, technical glitch. Uh, you can find more information about the IC London GNS on IC's uh, website or on their social media platforms. Um, so just search for IC London Graduate Students across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram and you'll stumble upon the right social media platforms. So on that note, over to you, Anshul. Yeah, thanks, Tavik. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the viewers from India and UK and to all viewers from the rest of the world. I am Anshul Sindhwani, Secretary, Tunneling Association of India, Young Members. I am there on behalf of our chair, Mr. Sandeep. And today we have an interesting talk from Michael. And would like to thank BTSYM and ICE for another collaboration on such an important topic. As we know, today's topic is managing safety in tunneling. It is one of the most important topics for effective construction and if ignored leads to serious consequences and that is the reason Mike is here today. So uh, before handing over to Mike, I'll just give a brief introduction about him. Mike started his career in mechanical engineering but soon progressed into construction. He has more than 30 years of experience in managing safety on significant projects both in India and UK. Mike's first project was Channel Tunnel back in 1989 and then he progressed to work on Heathrow Express, Jubilee Line Extension for Balfour BT. And the succeeding years saw Mike work on various projects, including DLR Extension Tunnel as a project safety advisor for Nishimatsu, all pipe, and jack, pipe jack and tunnels, including Dublin Port Tunnel as Group Area SHE Manager, UK SHE Manager for Carillion, Area Group EHS Manager for Kier, Tunnel Safety Manager for Dragados on Cross Rail and Bank Station Capacity Upgrade. Later on, in 2014, he moved to India and joined Larson and Tugbro l and Construction as EHS BU Head for Metros and Defense Projects, covering all tunneling projects across India, including one of the prestigious projects of Mumbai Metro Line 3. Last year, he has been assigned the role of l and Construction EHS IC Head for Heavy Civil Infrastructure, which includes all tunnels across India and international. Bike is basically a chartered member of Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, holds an MSc in Occupational Health and Safety, MA in Environmental and Safety Law, and a Diploma in Mechanical Engineering and Certificate in LLB and Strategic Management. So that's it from my end. I request Mike to take over and I hope you will enjoy today's talk. Thank you. Uh <clears throat> Yes, good afternoon and good morning. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, lovely intro, Anshul. I hope everybody can hear me well, and I hope everybody's safe and sound, um, particularly in India during this time, and obviously in the UK, emerging out of the uh, pandemic pandemic situation, which has placed us uh, in, uh, in precarious positions over the past year. Um, and my workload is certainly not... Uh, uh, reduced at all because of it, even working from home. Um, my my um, 
thoughts going through today. I've been asked to, to do a lecture. I must admit, I'm not a professional person at lecturing. So what I do is uh, I'll be speaking from my own experiences and um, some knowledge-based things. More of what I've learned over the past 30 odd years, specifically in tunneling. And um, most people don't know that I've actually worked in tunnels. So it's not just coming from a, a technical point of view. I'm uh, also applying a level of experience as I go through. So I hope you find it enlightening. I cannot cover everything that uh, I, I feel in tunnels. And the people who do know me probably know that uh, the depth of my knowledge and how I would approach things. However, I cannot express too much in the uh, slides given. So, however, without shadow uh, ado, further ado, I will move forward. Um, I'll just do, do a little introduction that is regarding to this. In tunneling, always plan for the worst. If you don't, it generally happens. And that is something that I personally really do believe in um, overall, because most people, if they don't think and plan ahead, particularly in tunneling, um, the significance of not doing that and really getting into the detail, uh, the chances are that it's going to happen, Will it will happen. Um, so moving forward from here, what are, uh, I've, I've covering is just generally uh, from the remit uh, given, a brief comparison of legislation between India and the UK, significant tunnel collapses in the UK that I've uh, been around, um, not been part of, but a significant part of it. Managing risk in India and UK, um, managing safety in tunnels, and competency training in tunnels in India and the UK. So moving on to this, what I'm saying about legislation, most people look at legislation, and from my point of view, um, it's an important part. It's an important part of what we do in both countries. But one of the things, a significant uh, thing which uh, I came across when I first came here back in uh, 2014 was uh, the comparison, because both countries are uh, building their legislation on, what, on the basis of common law. However, even though we go into the areas here of uh, um, breaches of, uh, of an act or of a regulation, and it's called a criminal offence, there is comparisons in the legislation that I've seen in different parts of it. In the UK here, we have what is known as a health, uh, uh, sorry, in the UK here, in India, but back in the UK, Health and Safety Work Act 1974, which is the equivalent of the Occupational Health and Working Condition, sorry, 2020, and also the previous one is a building other workers construction at BOCA. So there is a comparison between those two um, and the Health, Health and Safety Work Act 1974. You'll see certain sections uh, in both the uh, uh, legislation, which is comparable, and, and some of the actual wording, which I'll show a little bit later on. In the UK, we had the CDM regulations, and that was really significant. Uh, when I first started, there wasn't actually a, a thing called a risk assessment. Um, so that's how long ago that I started in safety and when it formally came about. But they moved on and they developed what is known the construction and design management regulations. And that had a huge impact uh, because it directly involved the, uh, the client and appointing of principal contractors and designers and putting ro uh, roles and responsibilities on key, key stakeholders, which previously before wasn't the case. It was very, very hard. Um, you do not have that in detail in India, but you do have reference to it. Um, moving on to the management, health and safety of work regulations, basically risk assessments, requirements, that is, appeared, that is significant in the UK. It's a European uh, directive which came in, uh, working time and uh, 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 directive, and which uh, um, basically took on the regulations from there into the UK. Confined space regulations and compressed air regulations, which are quite significant and uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, undertaken in the UK. Similarities can be made in India, but they're more strict in the, in the wording and uh, in comparison. Uh, moving on to the Health and Safety Work Act, I've just quoted uh, within that the Act 
it shall be the duty of every employer to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare work of all, all his and her employees. Now, if you look at the uh, code of 2020, which come about, you'll see exactly virtually verbatim, exactly the same in the code. Provide and maintain as far as is pre reasonably practicable a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of employees. So there's, there's a comparable um, between the, the, the two par parts of the legislation. So effectively, the, the Health and Safety Work Act uh, was uh, a truly tremendous piece of legislation when it came about, came about in 1974. And the reason is because there were so many acts relating to construction and regulations that they decided to, to do away with. When I first started in safety, you had the construction regulations, and that's what you used to use, particularly in tunneling. And um, yes, you had the guidance 6164, but the construction regulations were the equivalent of what is known as the BOCA to a certain degree. So they brought about the Health and Safety, uh, Health and Safety Work Act 1974, um, which is an umbrella act. So which from there, various different regulations that I referred to earlier came about. And then you had the introduction of European directives, which we had to take on board in the UK. But there again, other countries have learned from that. And because we're working on a common law basis, you will see similarities as what I've done here in India is reference to, to the 74 Act. So there won't be too much of disparity between the two. Moving forward, under the construction the design management regulations, the client has a duty, the designer has a duty, you have a, a principal contractor which has duties, contractor has duties. These are imposed duties which require each duty holder above to identify and manage risk. And then you make a, a similarity to the BOCA. And then it has underneath their responsibilities and duties of employers, architects, project engineers, designers, and building workers, etc. So you can see there's very much a comparison uh, between the two on how they're approaching it. Uh, adequate care shall be taken by the architect, project engineer, other professionals involved in the project, not to include anything in the design which involve the use of dangerous structures and other processes, materials hazardous to health or safety, um, of building workers during the course of erection, operation, execution, as in the case may be. And so that, that specifically puts a duty upon these, these uh, professions, as it does uh, I, under the construction and the design management, the client and the designer. So you can see there's a, a comparison between and comparable different, uh, uh, similar, similarities between the two there. Management of Health and Safety Work Act regulations. You identify the hazards to persons, identifying the risk, the likelihood and severity. Your elimination or reduction or risk or likelihood or severity by the controls. So first of all, when you're looking under the management regs, you first of all, you look at, you identify what the hazards are, you identify what the risks are. And the first thing is, is that can you eliminate it by other means? If so, can you reduce it? on whether the risk or likelihood or the severity by imposing the controls, i.e. a risk assessment. And then if you look under the ABOCA again, health and safety policy requirements, techniques and methods of assessment of risk to satisfy health and environmental and remedial measures, therefore. Again, that's requiring you to undertake a risk assessment. Then we go on to other parts. Most people are aware of BS 6164. It's a code of practice for health and safety in tunneling in the construction industry. Now that's, uh, I would say, is universally, universally uh, um, used around, I've used it or referred to it in Hong Kong as part of the contract. It's referenced to uh, the contracts here in India, um, particularly obviously in tunneling and any types of tunneling going on. And everywhere I've been so far working, is referenced to 6164 in the in the in the contract. Then the country in itself where the operations are taking place, they may have details of tunneling, but the code which is here gives you further guidance on how to interpret certain practices within tunneling. And now we've got another standard which is again international standard is ISO 45001. 
occupational health and safety standard. And what I'm going to say or going to ask people, what is the difference in the standards between the UK and India? In my personal opinion, there's virtually very little difference between the standards. However, one significant factor what stands out between the UK and India, and it's just one word, is called enforcement. And I'm just going back to when I started in safety many, many years ago, back in the late 80s, early 90s. There was uh, very much a, a cavalier attitude towards safety. And it was very, very hard. And, and it's too... CDM came about until the new regulations come about called the six pack and various other things uh, came about. Enforcement started to take hold in the UK and everybody started to take safety far more seriously than they previously did in the previous decades as in the 80s and, the, and in, the, in the 70s. And as we move forward into the 20s, they brought about a thing called the Corporate Manslaughter Act and that significantly changed the whole attitude towards safety because it was predominantly aimed at main board. It was predominantly aimed at uh, corporations. And it changed the whole outlook towards safety. And what um, people and companies are experiencing in the UK, the level of standard, the level of care, is completely different in India. It's not to say that the legislation is not here, but they don't have uh, an enforcement body. The enforcement predominantly comes from the client. The client takes on the various different enforcement of, through the contractual requirements, and they stick penalties upon you. And you could actually be eventually kicked off the project, but that's very unlikely. So from a governmental point of view, there is no enforcement of the, the legislation which is applicable in India here. And to me, that is the key to whether or not the standards are going to improve. I'm going to say that people uh, and uh, companies in India are the, uh, willing and um, look uh, completely moving forward to meet these standards. However, the enforcement of to, to, uh, to apply these standards is not there within the government bodies. So I think eventually in India, there will be time in the next decade or two decades, the, the enforcement or the level of safety, which is self-driven, will eventually meeting the standards which you, you uh, have more in the Western society will gradually evolve and, and be applicable here in India. I've seen a, a significant difference in uh, India since I've been here for the past seven years. And it's getting better. And what I'm saying, there is a will, there's a drive, there's a need and uh, to, to improve standards in India. And I'm saying this across all the, uh, uh, all, all, all the construction and tunneling fraternities, but effectively the main players, the main contractors, people like LNT, the AFCONs, and other, other uh, companies operating in India, they do take the standards very seriously and they, they do meet them. Some other, other companies may not meet them so well, but they do try to meet it. There's a desire to do that. Right, tunnel collapses in projects. This is where my personal uh, 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 view comes in here. Now, I'm sure when in my, in my introduction moved about Heathrow Express, um, previously, I was working at the Channel Tunnel, so I was approximately there just under five years, or roughly five years. And I worked for a company called Balfour Beatty, and uh, they transferred me over to uh, the Heathrow Express. Now, effectively, I was doing safety uh, at the Channel Tunnel, and this is my personal thing that I'm talking about here. I never really thought about doing safety in a full-time capacity even though they, they kept on uh, asking me to at the Channel Tunnel, I undertook my NEBOSH certification and I was moving towards NEBOSH diploma. But I was never fully uh, what I define as a, a full-time safety advisor or safety officer because I was more involved with the tunnels. Um, and But I took on uh, a role as a safety supervisor. 
So eventually I moved over to Heathrow. And when I arrived at Heathrow, um, who was doing, I uh, was working at CTA, Central Terminal a, um, Area. And this is where the, uh, the photograph that you see in front of you is where the collapse took place. If anybody has done any history uh, collapses in, in, in tunneling, this is a significant one. Because this is the first time that NATAM was being used, um, the Austrian tunneling method in the UK. So I was working there as part of the uh, uh, spray team. So between uh, doing uh, sinking the shaft and uh, eventually going into the tunnel and uh, spraying the shotcrete. Um, but I was still undertaking uh, a, the role to a certain degree in a safety capacity there, but I wouldn't undertake it full time. But unfortunately, um, the, the tunnel collapsed and I will go through and uh, try to share some of our experience in this. Some of the, the, the photographs that you see here on, on the uh, right hand side, well, for me on the right hand side, so you can see an area where the actual uh, shaft itself, that was the main shaft there, where it completely collapsed and it, it, it collapsed in the, late in the evening. Uh, roughly at between eight and nine o'clock. I'd have been working there uh, during the day shift. And I'm gonna move my pointer across. Now I used to work on the on the uh, downline and this section here. And effectively during that particular day shift, this particular line was shut down because the excavator to take away the, the London clay, uh, which was in this particular uh, area, uh, had broken down. but would progress quite significantly right under underneath Terminal 3 here. But this particular day, the, the excavator had uh, run out of diesel uh, from the night shift and was trying to bleed the system. So we was here just uh, mooching around. And throughout the, the day, they decided, they planned uh, previously to go along the concourse. Now, in this particular area here, when they first cut the tunnel eye here, the spray, uh, the the, the uh, actual concrete which was sprayed around this area wasn't uh, done in any kind of quality. And it was starting to lift with the pressure of the, uh, of the tunnel opening. So this particular day, they decided to excavate and repair the inverts to the tunnel eye opening to the concourse. And they started to do it. And they put all the gang from this side across into the tunnel to that side. And they were using uh, some of the gang, which has just started on here, uh, on this particular tunnel here, which is going on the up, 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 up line. So what happened throughout the day? They 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 broke away all the all the uh, invert from here, and then they progressed from there. So it's a double invert being excavated from here. However, and this is the bit that I found strange, and uh, this is the bit that I, I come into it that. At the, towards the end of the shift, they managed to get the excavator started. So he's instructed to excavate the tunnel face, but not here, down at this end, down here. So if I remember, and I'm going back some years now, and I've got a lot older, I can't remember if we was doing a bench or, uh, or a vert, but the, the bench, I think the bench was cut, and we can't part of, part of a vert down here. But I was getting quite annoyed because... That means we can't allow that to be left open. It's got to be sprayed. So it's getting towards the end of the shift. And towards this, towards the end of the shift, yes, exactly what I thought would happen, happened. We'd cut away this area here, and then the end of the shift failed and said, right, um, we will uh, move move from here and, and the night shift can come in. Then from there, what happened, around about 8 or 9 o'clock, uh, the night shift they came in and they started to gear up for this area here and particularly this area here. Then uh, uh, the workers, the uh, mates of mine who were working there, got the, uh, the necessary, uh, not so much the, the mobiles, but phone calls and the tunnels collapsed. Uh, ironically that nobody suffered or no lives were lost in this. But I asked the question, where did it start to go? And they said, in this area here. And what I found out, I said, were they, were, was this ever sprayed? And they said, no, only partially sprayed. Half of it was still left open, and they never sprayed here. So in my opinion, and for whatever it is through the investigation, we was never asked this, was never uh, from the authorities, was never interviewed. That was the cause of why that tunnel collapsed, because there was no support there. 
and it had been left open for well going on for approximately something like eight to nine hours. And there, from there, it gradually moved out and moved out. And the offices collapsed here. The batching plant was moving down. The gantry crane collapsed. And even the vehicles which are parked here for the night shift even went into, into the area. That's what's over there. So anyway, moving on from here. And this is a result of it. Uh, regulations came out. You've seen it. And there's a report there. Going on to this, another DLR extension. Uh, this is where I was working on the DLR extension. Um, this was going on uh, underneath the Thames. I was working for Nishimatsu. And what happened that uh, uh, when it was compressing the tunnel, uh, the tunnel had a blowout. And this was the end result. It was the uh, school playgrounds, um, which ended up with uh, approximately uh, his, uh, 22 meter wide, seven meter deep crater. And again, nobody was injured. And it surprised me because some of the segments were from, I'd actually left the company to be quite honest with you. I'd moved over to modems by, by this time. Um, so they found over in the area over here, they found some of the segments in, in, the, in the road. And what I, I can only say to you is the timing is everything. This happened approximately from what I was told around about six o'clock in the morning. Had it happened around about nine o'clock, between eight and nine, children would have been in this area here. So there'd been multiple fatalities without a shadow of a doubt. And over here is my good friend, Tommy Gallagher, um, a known Tommy for a few years. He was at the Jubilee line and, uh, uh, and our paths have often crossed over the years. And that just gives you a, a flavor of what happened there. But I'll go further to, to here to try to explain this. And again, this is my opinion. We've got a nice photograph, and this is the, the, the final area. This is where the station, uh, station is for the DLR extension going across to Greenwich. Before that, that used to be where the shaft was for the TBM. And over here, where the grounds are, this is where the, the site operations were with the offices. But this is where the, the playground was, and this is where the uh, blowout took place. So you imagine the line of the tunnel coming through here, and this is where the school is here, and that's where the playground. We're moving over to here. You can see the Thames, the Thames River above just here. Now, as the TVM came all the way down through and pushed all the way through to Greenwich, that was good. But during the, during the course of the... Um, uh, uh, um, tunneling. I'm just going to tell you a little bit. This point here, the blowout, over a period of time, as the TBM was coming, we got on one shift when I was there at, at this particular time. They lost a lot of bentonite, and nobody knew where it went. They couldn't understand. They didn't know if it had gone here, gone there. But if you look, go back to this photograph over here. This was AstroTurf. And then we had a phone call from the headmistress of this particular school saying, you've destroyed our, our playground. And then we found out where the bentonite had gone. And there was just nothing but humps all over this area. So it had gone pushed all the way up through onto the surface. So we found out exactly where the bentonite had gone. Anyway, we corrected the, 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 uh, the program and they continued with the tunneling. And then when we got down to this area, this had no bearing on the blowout, but it just gives you a thing. Um, about risk, and this is what I'm always leading up to, is that as this, we had a, a cross passage to, to undertake just here in, in cast, cast iron. So the TBM passed through, and the last, it was shoving forward, and then all of a sudden, water started seeping behind the back, back of the, uh, the cast iron, and they couldn't stop it because somehow in the logical uh, sequence of things in the design, they decided not to put any rubber sealing around the cast. I wasn't aware of this at the time. I've got to be totally honest with you. I was more interested in the, the safety elements of it. And water was absolutely pouring in. So the river, and it wasn't even on high tide, the pressure was coming through, and this tunnel was flooded. And I remember getting a call saying, Mike, the tunnel's flooded. Oh, yeah. And I thought, well, what am I? <laughs> you know, am I, am I going to stick my finger in there or something and stop it from happening? But anyway, I walked into the tunnel, and this was, and then it was up to your neck, and the uh, the necessary uh, pumps were going. We got additional pumps, but 
Nobody could understand what had happened. And they was trying to get grout in uh, from on the TBM. So the water was up to the platforms. It was stable, but increasing slowly. But what had happened, and I mentioned Tommy earlier, they was probably trying to push the grout behind and try to seal it, but it wasn't working. They was pushing through with the pressure. And everybody had got back to the offices and trying to figure out what to do next. And Tommy, being an old school miner, and he's still around now, fantastic guy, one of the people that you always want on your tunneling team. He owns his own company, and uh, he's the only multimillionaire that I know who wears a Rolex in the tunnel still. Um, still the same old Tommy. But he came up with this uh, solution that we ought to get hold of sawdust and mix it within the grout, then pump it behind because the fines from the grout was not holding behind the, the, the cast. So hopefully with the fine chip woods, it may jam in, in, the, in, the, in the gap and hold enough. And lo and behold, we ordered tons and tons of uh, um, sawdust, etc., pushed it in within the, in the grout pan, mixed it all up. They pumped it behind and it held. Tommy saved the day, probably saved the whole tunnel, to be honest with you. I'm telling you all this is going through. Anyway, they pushed through the TBM. Everything was secured. Nice. There was a bulkhead was, was put in this time. And I raised this with Tommy at the time. I was saying, Tommy, this, is, this bulkhead was very, very close to the entrance. And I said, particularly with the coverage, is this, is this OK? Or are we going to put another one in? This was early before they completed that tunnel. He said, no. So I was raising concerns, but you believe in what the designers are doing, and that was it. Then eventually I left the contract, and then within three weeks of me leaving, had the phone call, the blowout's taken place. And what I'm trying to express to you in telling you this long story is the fact that if you actually look back and what I was expressing, the warning signs were being created. I told you about the bentonite going up. I told you about the, the cover coming here in the bulkhead. So when they pressurized the, the tunnel eventually, because that's what they did, the pressure seeped up through this area here, exactly where the bentonite was going through. So it just goes to show you, if you're looking at risk, and particularly in tunnels, look for the significant um, sound bites. Look at what's happening and saying, why did that happen? Why did it occur? Because it's giving you red flags. Moving on to the next area that I worked on. I worked on the Jubilee line. I was there for just under four years. And this is Westminster Station. And it was probably one of the most technically challenging tunneling projects I've ever encountered in my 30 odd years. And I'm just going to give you another bit of a background. You can see Big Ben here. People are familiar with the UK, Westminster Bridge. And I used to walk across this bridge every single day. And this is Westminster Station. This particular box here has been sunk and you had no area in which to store materials. Whatever. Now, all the site offices was just here. We had various different sites. This is not the main site. It was across the other side of the River Thames. But there's a live metro station going up, uh, straight through the, the Westminster. And it was live all the time. So they put all the offices on the top here and built it over the top of the, the metro and um, or the underground, as we say, in the UK. And between all of that, this is what's going on. So this is where the muck from the tunnels was coming out to a certain degree and from the shaft sinking, delivered there, trucks come in, you come in, go out, come out through. But I'm drawing your attention to where this, this, this area is here. Now, this is quite significant because during the night time, you lift up the road decks to support ground treatment, which was going on in the whole of this area here. Because I don't know if people realize this, but Big Ben is on very, very shallow ground. In fact, it actually moves up. If you look into the history of it, it moves up and down slightly with the tide of the Thames. So because it was built many, many centuries ago, obviously. And I also bring you to attention here. This is where the power seating is. There's a shaft being sunk here that gave you access down to, to the uh, into the tunnels down below. And and the game is doing ground compensation around all this area here. Moving on. When you actually look at the side thing, and the reason why I'm saying this is that the fact is that these are the two tunnels. When you come across the Thames, the tunnels run in parallel, but then the TBMs had to divert and go one on top of the other, and they run parallel against the uh, Big Ben. And five times Big Ben listed into the red. 
And as I said previously, this is it, this become a panic mode sort of situation. And what happened was that the fact is that the TBM, as they moved forward, the ground was moving and it was slowly listing. The big band was listing. So what we had to do is that uh, as part of the team is to ensure that the ground compensation took place. And it went on for about two months. You could only move forward approximately two rings and then gradually jack up Big Ben, move forward, jack up Big Ben, move forward until the TBMs were safely clear and they were running parallel. And eventually they came across St. James's Park, one on top of the other, then they run parallel with each other. And this is the escalation box. So if you ever go on the underground, I went back there or in the UK, it was about four years ago, and it's the first time I'd gone into this station uh, box as a, as a passenger. Prior to that, I was used to looking up at the uh, underneath the uh, station and watching the, the tube trains come in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fantastic but technically challenging job to be on. Um, I covered the whole of the tunnels and sections of the, the surface as well. Moving on to the risk, there is not, never one single factor which leads to any accident or incident. However, a single factor which commonly appears with such significant failures occur is ignorance of the risk. I do strongly believe that. If you're ignorant of the risk, then that is the most significant factor. Because people, as we are as humans, we individually and collectively have different perceptions of risk. Each one of us, one of you listening, we have our different involvements. And I studied uh, university safety and I got heavily involved. And I did a thesis and I think Asel, who's listening, and I think I explained to him. And I, I, I did this thesis uh, many years ago on, on this. is, is effectively um, on uh, does zero, zero tolerance reduce accidents in construction? And effectively, I looked into the psychology of why people do what they do and the reasons they do it. And one of the things I do, do I, I, I can tell you, that our personalities are developed by the time we're age of five. So we have already have a perception of risk by our social dynamics, social environment. So that is why we collectively individually have different perceptions of risk. Often we question what is the likely outcome of this scenario happening and when undertaken an assessment of risk. A person may never experience an action or a significant failure, so their assessment is generally likely to undervalue the potential of those risks, which I firmly believe in. When you experience a, a, a significant failure or an accident, you become heightened, become aware of what is likely to happen. So when you undertake a risk assessment, you bring all those factors in uh, into your risk assessment, and you're likely to go to the other side of the pendulum where you're risk averse. Most risk analysis is subjective and based upon assumptions. There is no outcome. We generally assume the controlled measures worked. The law enforces to, uh, us to put certain controls in place, i.e. certain regulations I described earlier, certain acts in either the UK or India. And this is usually using an accrued product practice as well or industry guidance. And by default, we manage the risk. And that's when we look at 6164 for guidance. We're looking for those controls, hopefully, and uh, we, we put in the correct controls. So moving on to managing risk. Risks are not fully considered <coughs> far from plant where in, from the below tunnel or above the station box or, or below. These are significant things that I tend to find. Um, when we're undertaking tunneling. Most people look at TBMs, but I tend to find, and when I was in Mumbai, as uh, I was when I was introduced, I was saying to people, what about fire from plants and operations, you know, uh, below the tunnel? Which, where does it come from? When I was taken under uh, uh, risk assessments many, many years ago, it was not considered at all that an excavator is likely to catch fire or more than likely a loco, uh, a loco is going to catch fire. Buildings are badly maintained and they could be inadequately built. This was a particular uh, a situation which was uh, in, in, in Mumbai. We also found that in Greenwich on the DLR extension, when pushing through the TVM below, 
the the uh, the buildings above started to show started to show stress, started to crack. Vibration causes stress to buildings. Now in Mumbai, um, we could talk about Mumbai to a certain degree, but the buildings are 120 years old. Some of them are not well maintained at all. When you look at them in a in a physical sense, you can see different plants, weeds, trees, and that growing out the side of the building. So. The, what they're built on is is rock, and I'll describe it as rock. Um, there's better experts than me to uh, describe it. So my concerns were not that, like in London clay, we're going to be taking out things and you've got heave, you've got movement of the clay, etc. but more than likely vibration, vibration from the TBM, vibration from the cutter head of the uh, 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 under the natum from the excavator. Could it transfer up? And then that vibration caused these buildings to start showing stress and potentially collapse. And you have to undertake a project risk assessment on that, a project risk register. Because as I explained to people, these buildings are occupied. And to what degree? Are they got families in? Have they got, uh, have they got uh, work uh, offices in? They've got working areas and things of this nature. So you have to look at the risk to outside and beyond what you're actually doing. Potential ground movement due to excavation, noise from plant and breaking rock. Um, on the DLR, um, which I explained before or showed you before, the night time, the decibels couldn't exceed not 45. Now, when we undertook um, noise monitoring, the locals were creating over 65 decibels. And in Mumbai, in specific areas, you could not exceed zero. So how are you going to construct uh, a tunnel? How are you going to construct the, the station? That's according to, to the legislation and uh, uh, under environmental law. So also lighting surrounding environment, safety versus the, the safety versus the environment, because sometimes you can light up the area and it can cause a distraction and it, and it can affect locals as well. Uh, nighttime sleeping, blah, 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 can go, go on. So again, then if you reduce it, it can also have an effect on, on the safety of the workers during the night time. So flooding also is a, a change in the climate, a heavy rains. Now, most people assume, uh, like in places like Mumbai, even here in Chennai, you get heavy rains monsoon. But it also happens in the UK. It also happens in Hong Kong. It can also happen in the Middle East. But because in certain areas you're expecting it, you're planning ahead for it. However... In certain uh, countries, you're not expecting it because they said, OK, then fine. But what's the chance of it going to happen? So you have to look back. You have to look forward. You have to look at it in your in your planning and say, is it likely to happen? Have we got history over it? We cannot ignore it because it can have a detrimental effect, not just on the tunnels, uh, on lives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. We can lead to environmental breaches, high court injunction in Mumbai. It lasted over nine months. You can lead to loss of life, loss of property, rehousing of, of residents. A lot of people don't really consider that. I can assure you that if I'm asked to uh, vacate my property, I am not going to be going to a two or three star hotel for a short duration. I want compensation. I want to be staying in a five star hotel. Uh, so those are the kinds of things. What about pets? What about elderly people? Uh, all these type of things have to be taken in consideration. Claims from businesses. Um, I'm slightly digressing here. I remember uh, back on the Jubilee line um, at Waterloo Station, uh, they was doing some, uh, un uh, some piling and they hit one of the main uh, power lines to the southeast of London and it completely blacked out. This is roughly about six o'clock in the evening, and I didn't know it had happened. And uh, Waterloo Station, all the trains stopped. Eventually, they got partially got going again, but all the businesses, all the all the the pubs, uh, the restaurants, they all had to be shut down, or they were shut down. All the food went off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the type of things what happen in our industry, and things that we have to consider. Rerouting of traffic is another one. If you've got an incident occurs, um, particularly in the lower and um, below in your station boxes, and ironically, I showed you a, a, a particularly highlighted a shaft at uh, uh, the House of the Parliament. 
um, where uh, some timber in uh, caught fire due to some welding on a, a small uh, drive that they were doing. And the smoke which came out of that shaft was unbelievable. It was an embarrassment. It stopped the traffic. Traffic had to be rerouted. And anybody knows Parliament Square, that is not an easy thing. So these are the type of things that uh, you have to consider. Um, and also emergency vehicles. If, you, if, you've, if they've been cut off, they don't know the route and they've got a specific route to go through. How are we or what we're doing? How are they going to get from A to B in the event of emergency? The last thing we need is that somebody can't get to uh, a, a, a residential building because we've cut their route off and we haven't considered that in our risk, risk profile and longer timing to reach certain lo locations. The fire brigade trying to get to a building or because they've got to divert because we've diverted the road. So they, you're going to have total inclusion. And I've always carried this out on all the projects I've done in tunnels um, over the years. Uh, so, and then you have negative press. Anyway, quickly moving on. Um, tunnels under the stations, uh, and these are the type of things that are going through. Um, at the moment here, I'm just showing here in uh, Mumbai, Underneath here is a complete excavation. So this is how close the buildings are to the, the station box. From there to there is completely excavated and the traffic's running across. Over here was Jubilee Line. And effectively, the tunnels went below underneath here, across the river, over to the Houses of Parliament over there, which I was describing. And very briefly, this building here, um, this wheel wasn't there. That's where our offices was. This building here, everything below there was completely excavated. So it just goes to show you the risk involved with tunnelling. Uh, as again, this is the closeness of the building's uh, proximity of used in Mumbai, and that's the breakthrough which came came below uh, at the at the tunnel there in Mumbai, uh, right next to the buildings. There are. There's another couple of shots there. I'm. Uh, obviously conscious of time as well now, so I'm going to quickly move move forward. Uh, that's how close the piling rigs were to the buildings, all within two metres of those buildings. These buildings are historic. They're over 120 odd years old. Um, another few shots there going through, and that goes uh, down and overseeing. And what you must understand as well, from the perspective, there's a good 60,000 people every day, or used to, I'd say every day, not now at the moment, but in the peak times over a year ago, used to be around these station boxes. So pedestrian control as well as traffic was, uh, was a priority, as it is in any, any uh, major city around the world. Moving on to considering risk during the design. You have to consider the risk to the cutter heads. This is very important um, because if you are looking at interventions, and you've got to get people into it, is looking at the type of cutter head you're using. How, how, how do you consider the risk? Because you're putting men at the front of that cutter head and to renew, uh, <coughs> renew them. And the more times you have to do it, the more the chance of something's going to go wrong. So designing and looking at the cutter heads, the type of ground you're going in is one of them. Suppression systems on the TBM or even on plant. Most people look at the TBM about uh, fire suppression systems, making sure they're adequate and they can do the job, particularly electrical cabinets, heat detectors, gas detectors, emergency rescue chambers. This comes to the fore fairly recently. When I was on Crossrail, we put an uh, uh, emergency rescue chamber in on the TBMs there. And I'll be honest with you, uh, it was over a fair length of time. It's all based on risk, but that's under 6164. And you have to ensure the safety of your of your people working on the TBM in the event of a fire occurring. Now, however, I don't want to mislead people. It's to protect people in a fire. It's only can protect people in the event of a smoke. So if you got to high levels of uh, uh, temperature, the chance of a rescue chamber um, doing the job of, uh, uh, of uh, protection from fire is, is greatly reduced. Movement sensors, the erector arm, these are things which are coming into the fall now, but I firmly believe they should be more to the fall when you're looking at design, because people tend to get in the way, they tend to rush in the in the build area, and you've got to have sensors which cut, cut them off. You can't rely on, on humans. 
And again, looking at interventions, how many interventions more are, are likely to occur with this TBM? Are they likely to occur? And why are you planning ahead? How are you going to do it? How are you going to plan the emergencies? How are you going to plan getting those people out in the event of emer emergency? Not how they're going to do it when they're, they're able to do, do it, but when they're, they're injured. I can assure, assure you that a person who's fallen uh, to the base of this 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 particular TBM, how and when you're looking at design, how are you going to get him up to the, the to the opening here? Is it better to design it at this level, or is it better to have it at that top where the the man lock is going to be? These are all considerations to take when you're considering the risk in in the design. Risk of the casting yards and, and in that um, our casting yard here was developed because of the shortage, because what I'm saying here when I'm re referring to Mumbai. The casting still went ahead, even though there's nine months behind. What do you do with all the segments? So you had to design a yard which can take the loading. Was the ground prepared for that? Was was the risk when it, the ground was prepared, considering that they're going to have double stacking going on? Um, no. So we had to redesign how they're going to be stacked because the ground and the bearing, that you're going to end up with all those segments toppling over and potentially killing killing people. And again, the movement of trucks in a very confined area. Managing risks in the tunnels. You have to look at fire, you have to look at collapse, you have to look at plant movement, explosions, gas, oxygen, depletion, flooding, and electrical. These are just the key main ones going on. I would say to me, that is the biggest one to me, fire. We can design, we can work around this type of situation with TBMs, etc. Plant movement's another one. Fire is, in my view, probably one of the biggest killers. We can look at this. We can reduce that. We can reduce this. Flooding, we can we can plan, and, and the chance of that happening is great to reduce. And electrical, again, we can control that. So overall, to me, this is the biggest, biggest risk. It's got a multiple lives. So moving into that, um, how are we going to do it? Tunnel entry. This is just to give you a comparison. We've got to move on from this. However, I still firmly believe of the old tally in, tally out system. We moved on to swipe cards on Crossrail, where you could identify, we, we, we got hold of a credit card size swipe cards where you swipe, and he gave the, uh, the personal security uh, as you're swiping into going to the tunnel. And this is something which I really firmly believe in, is that the fact that the swipe card can identify it, making sure you're the person and also you're qualified and you're competent to go into the tunnel. It gives all the history of the training that you've undertaken on the swipe card. But to me, on the emergency, and the reason why we, we did this at Crossrail and implemented it, if you've got a, you're stuck in a tunnel and you've got another entry point or exit point later on where you've broken through a particular shaft, then you can swipe out at that particular exit. However, what we did was when you swiped out a different exit with your card, it registers in the central computer, and then we can have a printout and we can tell where you've exited so we know you're not in the tunnel. So we know who's in the tunnel and who's escaped the tunnel by, by another exit. But the good old tally system is still uh, the one at the backup because if your system's down, you still know tally in, tally out, and it's got to be enforced. A tunnel is no good because I've been in situations, particularly on Jubilee Line, where we had to actually have to evacuate the tunnel. The fire brigade is called. We had two people unaccounted for. And because they didn't use the system correctly, they came around the corner with a coffee. They decided they want to go and have, have breakfast, but they didn't tell you. But we're putting people's lives at risk, i.e. the fire brigade, to go in to find out where you are. And... Uh, this is this is where the the importance of enforcement comes in. Moving on, tunnel rescues. This is very very important. Um, we have very good tunnel rescue procedures going on in the UK now. When I was back in 2011, 2012 at Crossrail and beyond that, they weren't so good. But we set up a, a team. I set up a, a team of paramedics, specific tunnel rescue team. We went through. We used to video. We've done the various different uh, 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 trainings on the TBM and we got it down and it was really good. We had a specific rescue team and people uh, may not think this is not going on in India, 
but this is just to give you a picture. This is the tunnel rescue team identified in Mumbai uh, on the project I was on there. And we went through and um, it was good to see. We had them on each shift and they were fully conversant. We went through practice and uh, went through. But the main thing about tunnel rescue is that when you look at the legislation, the fire brigade, or should I say the emergency services, do not have uh, or are, are not legally responsible to go into a tunnel. We are responsible for the rescue in the tunnel. However, I've never come across any emergency service in refusing to go in and to assist. In fact, they do insist on being uh, called and to help and to think. But you've got to understand, when you're planning this, the, the, the emergency services themselves do not go in tunnels every single day. But these guys, they, they, they may be trained, but they're not fully uh, uh, aware of what they're going to face because nobody wants to put someone else in. So that is why it's important to have all the equipment, all the suppression systems, planning for the risk so you don't put these people at risk in order to try and save somebody as well. Going through access and the risk until breaking through and uh, making sure that there's a, a, um, a, 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 a firm access and egress from your tunnels. Until a breakthrough or cross passage, there's only one way in and out. Panic, uh, people panic when things go wrong. I can assure you. I've seen people, even the best people, in the event of emergency, they, they panic. Uh, I've seen even good people who you thought you could rely upon um, deteriorate before your eyes in the event of emergency. Some people step up to the game. But the more you practice and the more you plan it and the more you exercise, people will become absolutely confident in what they've got to do. However, you've got to ensure all the accesses are always clear. Do not obstruct them. Uh, Jubilee line, we had a situation once where our rescue cage was stuck in the corner because someone had moved it and we needed an emergency and it's going to take time to get it. And that's the kind of situation uh, that you've got to have and have your emergency equipment always checked, always ready at any given time. Um, and this is another access going through. Uh, another thing is that uh, um, you've got to make sure that the, the when you're accessing, got a secondary form of access from your shafts, it can take the load. Don't assume that everybody's going to do it one at a time because, as I said earlier, people panic. You may have several people trying to get up through your access, and then you've got to make sure that it's fit for purpose. It can take a, a certain amount of people coming up through. Not everybody's going to get in the man rider. They try to crowd it, and this is where the overload, uh, over limit switch comes in. If they try to run in and got people stuck, the best way is to get people to go up through a secondary access. Um, these are a couple of shots I took um, um, actually uh, before I put place the shots here. And what I'm saying to you, this is Crossrail, and this particular shot on the, on the left-hand side here, if you're going through, I wanted them to extend it. Because if a, 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 a loco or something derails, this is where it's going to go. It's going to go over here. So this is the risk coming in, this dog leg coming through here. Not, not ideal. This is Crossrail down at Limo, and it's going from one uh, breakthrough area into another. So this is what I'm saying, looking for potential risk. And this particular area here, is making sure safe access and egress all the way along as uh, it's going through. This is a tunnel, one of the tunnels in Mumbai under LNT. Another one going through, safe access coming along the walkways across here, but also in the event of emergency using a man rider. And one thing you must do is plan for it. And I'm showing you here, this has got an entrance. And this is how you put, uh, you've got to ensure when you plan ahead for emergencies, uh, to put emergency equipment in, and you can put stretchers in and things of this nature. You'll be surprised how you've got man riders have not considered it in the past, and they've got no way of getting people out. And then you put a stretcher on, the, on a flatbed, and you're taking people, and you're trying to hold people, several people. And that's your emergency team as well, or your rescue team. They've got to be safe as well, so not to put them in a precarious situation. Again, looking at incident control rooms, you're looking at... Uh, 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 the monitoring of gases, et cetera, and the heat seekers and alarms, and then having integrated alarm systems in the tunnel, which uh, raise the alarm. Some of them are becoming more advanced now. You can have sensors, you can detect, you can have warning signs. But the main thing is, is you have an instant control room, 
that can see the alarm going off on these sensors, which are coming up through your tunnels, through your TBM, and it's a warning signal, and get people prepared and ensuring that the rescue team's prepared with you in, within your incident control room, as the photographs I showed you with the right equipment. So it goes through what you have, what would happen, what do you have if the alarm went off? And then this is a lot of people must make sure that they, they go through the exercises and ensuring that uh, they uh, uh, fulfill the, the requirements and ensuring that they uh, take the necessary precautions if the alarm goes off. And even if it's a false alarm, the problem is if you have too many false alarms, it tends to cry wolf and people get lacked. And then you have a real emergency and people are not taking it seriously. Uh, again, identification in the tunnels. We got here in English and we got here in, in, the, in Hindi. So what else? Emergency lighting. I always say to people when you're looking, you're looking at emergency lightings, make sure you put underneath distance and direction signs. If none of you have experienced of smoke inside a tunnel, it's probably the most uh, disorientating situation to be in. The only way I can explain it, if you've driven in, particularly in the UK, trying to drive in fog, you know where you're going along the road, but you can't see the signs, so you become uncomfortable and you slow down because it's like pea super, we call it. That's what it's like with smoke inside of a tunnel. So I'm saying the thing that you look towards is emergency lighting, the, the, the glow. And then underneath, you give them direction because people become disorientated very quickly, show them where they got to go, the distance to, to, to the uh, getting out the tunnel, how many meters, making sure that you've got uh, locating communication underneath there. It's no good having the communication halfway the tunnel lining, a uh, tunnel lining, you can't see it. So the best place is always to put emergency light in. Nobody says you, you only have to put in so much, so many. Put it where the, you, you've got uh, uh, the communication and people can see. Put down key numbers like the ring number, the contact number. I get annoyed when people put it on bits of paper. Put it in a, in a very large, bold letters. This is the number to dial. This is the, the contact number you need. This is where you are. So people are panicking at this time. They can see what, what, what's to be done. Don't forget, they're not going to be in a nice situation. So it's to make it easier. Think of those. Uh, one way in, one way out. And this is the, the problem that uh, planning ahead is that if you look at these type of tunnels, the environment is this one. This is in North India um, and the location. You've got to look at it um, regarding and the protection of people, when, particularly when plants going in and et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to have segregation, important to have clear lighting that people can see when moving plants about. And this is another one. When you're doing uh, lining to, to natum uh, tunnels, the type of formwork, the plant going in and out, uh, et cetera, there's more chance of risk happening here. And I'm just going to bring to your, uh, your attention, there's certain risks, people falling from height, plant coming in here, the lighting, casting shadows, trip hazards, access going up through here these are all things to be considered when forming shuttering etc going into a tunnel coming down here the biggest act, uh, the risk is in here particularly if the operator i really moan people don't realize you assume that he can see you but if these windscreen and, and his visibility is obscured by shotcrete and muck then he's it doesn't matter how good the lighting is he can't see you so segregation here the other thing is what I also insist on or try to insist on, in all honesty, um, particularly uh, on plant, is having suppression systems, making sure that if you've got a diesel generator, a diesel engine, it has an automatic suppression system inside there. You're not opening it up to a fire extinguisher. If the suppression system, if you've got a fire inside that, that compartment, then it automatically uh, puts the fire out. It only costs a minimal amount, but it saves uh, can save a lot of uh, uh, lives that way. Because if this catches fire, people can be trapped down there. The smoke's coming down. That's why it's important to have self-rescuers. The other one is uh, having the TBM, uh, prevention of unauthorized persons coming into the tunnel. A lot of people love to go in tunnels, and particularly when they're doing uh, operations on the TBM. The other one is drill and blast and making sure that people are prevented from going in to the tunnel. 
and only authorised people come through. PPE is always the last resort. I can't stress that enough. When you're looking at risk, you must look at it from right at the beginning, from the design aspect, from the from the, the ground conditions you're going in. Uh, hopefully that's uh, made that obvious with the disasters which come about through, uh, through the ages. Um, they are significant. PPE is not going to help you in that, in that result. So when you're looking at tunneling, you've got to look at the risks. You've got to look at the planning ahead because if you don't, the chances are it will happen because it's not being considered. And what I'm saying about it, when you come all the way through and you look at uh, the project risk register and you look at the safety risk registers and how are you um, developing your risk um, profile, you've got to consider all the aspects in it where your risk going to come from, what is likely to happen. And then the last result, things like this, PPE comes into its own because you cannot el eliminate all of it. You may have some residual risk, i.e. To the, to the worker. It may be an eye injury, it may be this or something happening, but you've got to minimise it. So PPE is always the last resort. And very finally, confidence in training in tunnels in India. In India, they've started what is known as a Tunneling Excellence Academy. LNT have started this, and it's an absolute, um, uh, a, a, a huge step forward. You have that in, in the in the UK. They started a Tunneling Academy in Ilford way back in Crossrail, and it's to bring forward the skill sets of tunnelers. Most tunnelers are prior to that. Um, I learn on the job and most of them come from different backgrounds and they didn't have any formal training in tunneling and in UK they started it and in uh, in LNT they started the Tunneling Excellence Academy in order to progress that we bring competent and trained people to work in tunneling and that's on every level from engineers to workers etc cetera, etc cetera. the virtual reality training goes on and it's interactive and this is what's going on in India at present time. Um, so you've got here our CEO, uh, SNS, who's using the uh, interactive skill sets to, to operate the, uh, the build, uh, your extra arm. It's just a demonstration and going through and the things of this nature to develop engineering and managers. And going through uh, virtual reality training. I cannot stress this enough, virtual reality training brings in, it's got to be done in, in emergency situations. You've got to bring it more into tunneling. I know it's been happening in Thames Tideway, et cetera, et cetera. But again, this is the type of thing that we've got to bring into safety and particularly in tunneling, because as I stressed earlier, the chances are that I'm hoping with all the precautions, all the controls in place, nobody ever has experienced a fire in a tunnel. However, we need to express this and we can do this through virtual, virtual reality training that uh, we can develop and show people the consequences if we do not take the correct precautions and apply the uh, right controls. And this is online training as well, which is being developed here. Online training. And the good thing about this is that you can do a video. But what's going through here, and just bringing to your attention here, that when the uh, person's doing the online training, they go on to this virtual uh, reality and it goes through and they see something going on. This is something which is bringing forward more and more that someone's operating a drill here and they go through and testing. Once they've been taught about the procedures, what type of PPE should they have been wearing? And they've got to click on it and they go through this whole testing procedure. So effectively, it's tele testing their knowledge base when they're going through. So hopefully they retain it more than just taking it, sitting in the classroom and taking it on verbally or now through teams and going all the way through. So thank you very much for taking me through my journey of my projects I've worked on and the experience. Um, I don't know the time, I've lost track of the time, so I hand over now. Thank you very much, so it'll be over to questions. Thanks a lot, Mike. I think that was a very good, good whistle stop tour of um, effectively managing safety within tunneling, but certainly, you know, there were those elements of your own personal experience from Heathrow and um, and DLR extension and Jubilee Line extension, which uh, which which are basically gold dust for any young tunneler out there in the industry. So thanks a lot for uh, sharing your personal experience with us today. Um, yeah. On that note, yes, um, we'll just switch over to the Q and A. Uh, we've already had a few 
uh, questions in the chat now. But just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please uh, drop them uh, on the YouTube chat. So I might as well start with a question from uh, from my site, Mike. Um, so during the comparison of the health and safety legislations between UK and India, you mentioned uh, that um, the wordings are effectively similar. And of course, there was mm. the element of reasonable uh, practicability in in both the, uh, both the legislations. But then, of course, you also touched on uh, the difference in perception of risk from person to person. So my question really is that is there also a difference in perception of reasonably a reasonable practicability between India and UK? And if so, um, what is the difference and how does it alter risk management approaches in the two countries? Um. The, I, the only way I can really express, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to say, because law is, is well, obviously one of the areas uh, I've, uh, I've looked in. I'm using the words, so far as region practicable, is that what I'm finding that um, the, the legislation here is very prescriptive. And the wording, so far as region practicable, is taking all reasonable precautions that you could and what you could foresee, i.e. through the risk. And um, but what is happening at that and that is through understanding the 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 guidance. Now, if you if you try to understand what how I'm trying to answer the question, is the fact that what you do is you have in the UK regulations like the compressed air regulations or the management regulations. But in India, you don't have regulations. It's, it's not, it's prescriptive. So it doesn't give you any kind of uh, basis in which to uh, carry out uh, a risk analysis of, uh, of uh, an, uh, drawing upon the guidance from the, what that regulation was interpreting. And but if you look into VOCA, for instance, it's very prescriptive. And it is, for instance, if you look at certain requirements, it's not a uh, undertake a, a risk analysis and put in the, the controls necessary for the situation you're in. It's either you do or you don't. So the, the wording so far as reason practicable um, is virtually the same but its interpretation is completely different in either countries. One's more prescriptive, and the other one is, 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 is risk-based under guidance. Understood. Thanks a lot for that. Um, we might take a few questions from the floor. Uh, we've already got a few. Uh, the first one is from a, user called a, a viewer called AT, and it's, it's, it's a reasonably broad question, but uh, AT asks, what is the safest method of removing a TBM uh, from a tunnel under the sea? Of removing a TBM from un under the seabed? Um, well, I, I, I'm just going to say that it, it, all, it all depends. <laughs> the only way that you would, uh, one or two, do, and this is really an engineering uh, way of doing it, You've got two choices, in my view, is either you don't remove the TBM and you plan that ahead and you drive the TBM. Well, that's what happened in the Channel Tunnel. They didn't remove the TBMs, um, it, all of them. They drove the TBMs down into, into the seabed or uh, below the, the, the surface and then capped them. Or um, you have to dismantle it and drag it back but you've got to dismantle it within the uh the tunnel itself or then the other option is to <laughs> and i'm only speculating on this not i've actually seen it is where you create a coffer dam where you actually retrieve it from the coffer dam it's a very open question and one that requires uh, an engineering uh, more perspective, to be quite honest with you. 
certainly elements of that which would also depend on the tide difference and so on. Mm-hmm. So on that note, I think let's move over to the next um, question from Kemi. And uh, they ask, how much warning did the guys on Heathrow Express uh, get to get out of the area before any injuries might have happened? And I think a supplement well, I, I, to their, uh, the, the question is, uh, is NATM the same as SCL? I can tell you that um, the virtually there wasn't much warning. And I can tell you with certainty that the reason why um, nobody actually lost their life is all to do with timing. As I said on the DLR, when the blowout took place, when they pressurized the tunnel, they took it up to the maximum. I think it was six bar. And it failed. The timing was early hours in the morning. Had they done it later, then probably would have multiple deaths. So to answer your question, believe it or not, the timing the tunnel started to collapse, it started to show weaknesses. The, it was the timing that majority, and this is uh, and this is what I'm telling you. Most of the viners and most of the people in the tunnel were up in the canteen having their last break because the last break was taking place and we always used to leave it to the last minute because the next one before the canteen opened was not too early hours in the morning. So it was timing more than the fact that there was warning. And because majority of the people were already up in the canteen and then the warning signs started to to, um, uh, (coughs) come about, then... If the people have been further on in, in the in the tunnels themselves, I doubt very much if they would have got out. So majority of people uh, had little time to try and get out because the majority of people were already in the canteen at that particular time. I think if I must add, uh, certainly there was a report by Health and Safety Executive on, on the collapse as well, which might be a good read for people. Sorry, could you just re- um, miss that one? Um, I was just adding you know, that there's there's a report by Health and Safety Executive on the collapse, which might be a good read for the for the listeners. Yeah, which does no, go through the timeline yeah. of the day. Yeah, and and that's what I'm saying about it is that this is purely my experience, and you know, was just leading into it to the the collapse, and uh, it was probably. My my personal view, coming from a uh, tunneling perspective, it was probably not. It, it was the, probably the most worrying project I've ever been on. Um, and I'm I'm showing this when we used to cut the crown, and we used to be up in the mupe, and uh, we had a vibration of the Piccadilly line running parallel to us, and it used to vibrate, and we used to look at one another. And uh, say, come on, quick! Let's, let's get the mesh up and let's get spraying quickly, because that is the the the, the uh, concerns. Now, the shock creek we were using, because it was coming from outside of Heathrow, 90% of the time it was off before it even arrived, because I used to touch it and we couldn't spray it. So in the crown, we had more on the ground than we did in the crown, and um, we used to use more accelerant to try and get it to stick. And the uh, I laugh about it because we used to joke. And when accelerant got on your skin, it used to burn it. it some of us looked like as if we'd been shot by a, a shotgun because we'd been peppered because our, our skin had got these little little burn holes on the little where the splashes of the settling had got on. Uh, sorry, uh, accelerant had got onto the onto the skin. So uh, yeah, it was uh, one of those tunnels which you, you, I wouldn't say the word bad one, but we were all we we're all showing signs that. This is not good. And that's before the collapse. Well, on the, uh, on the topic of Heathrow, we've got a question from Colin Warren. Uh, and Colin mm-hmm. asks, regarding the Heathrow collapse, uh, the concourse tunnel invert short repair uh, was, to ha- um, was to have been done as a series of small areas rather than opening up a large area. What was actually done? Well... At the time, it was they uh, they opened up a double double vert. You should have you, you're quite correct because when you're spraying, he was doing one section and the other, but they decided to open up a double vert, and so you had the tunnel. The concourse eye was o- completely exposed, and they um, they only partially 
sprayed part of it. But then on the opposite side, towards the end of that shift, they decided to, on the downline, to open up the equivalent, uh, the vert parallel to it. It's virtually parallel on either sides of the uh, of the wall. You know, I'm not the expert, and I'm, I'm saying it, but, I've, uh, you know, even the people like me uh, to turn around and say, you've got to be crazy to be start to take out of a parallel to the to the other side, because you've got no no support there, you know. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, we've got a question from Asil that's just popped up. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, of managing mental health and well-being of tunneling professionals with future legislation codes in the safety after your experience of emergencies and prevention of risks? Um, what are my thoughts managing mental health and well-being for tunneling professionals? Uh, future uh, um, It's a good one, Asil, uh, I must admit. And, and I think it's something we've got to consider. Um, because I think in our industry that we are always considered, and I'm, I'm telling you now, I've met some of the hardiest, strongest individuals I've ever met in my life. And we physically, I've worked along some guys who uh, physical were, were physically will put some of the people in the gym into, in, into the minor category. Um, but when you're looking at the, 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 the mental aspects of it, we haven't really considered it. And I'll be quite honest with you. And um, we've got to, the only bits I would say we, we probably do at this present time is that I've always done it myself, that if anybody's been involved with an accident, and particularly in the UK, and they're showing signs of uh, even the hardiest I've come across, are starting to show signs of uh, uh, stress, then we, we got to offer people counselling and, uh, and be able to talk about it. Because you've got to understand that in our industry, and particularly the type of people who we are, we don't exactly bond and share intimacies. So we've got to look beyond that and offer it, and it could be external. But it's a good point and something to be valid. It's something that we're not, we're not dealing with, I don't think. I still said in terms of handling emergencies, isn't that? But we might as well move over to the next question uh, by Charles um, in the chat there. And Charles asks, in the UK, we're giving more and more attention to health risks of construction. Does India have health on its agenda? Absolutely. Um, I would say in some, uh, in some areas it's better. Um, it's, uh, I, I can assure you that everything is comparable. And um, I can only speak to, I'm, I'm saying re within reason and what we're dealing with and uh, uh, everything else. And this is where I'm saying the legislation comes in. But a lot of the time is that people are always looking and also looking, what I find, what I find fascinating as well here in India, looking at innovation as well. So health is always considered. Uh, the workers particularly, there's huge drives in consideration uh, work, workers' health on the project. Everybody undertakes medicals. They undertake uh, various different... Uh, uh, um, even this year, I'm just writing a strategy for next year. And um, because I, I'm going to backtrack, some of the workers that we do have may not have access to, to good health care. So we, in effect, on our projects, take care of that. We also have um, doctors, full-time doctors. Um, we have clinicians coming in, and um, which is comparable. And I can say to you that on the projects we have, some of the equipment is almost to hospital level. Some of the equipment that we buy and ensure is available to take care, and we have ambulances on site. We have certain equipment, and we're all. They also look at all the aspects. Now we've undertaken various different studies by uh, doctors, actually on the tunnels and uh, on uh, skin disease and where it's coming from, um, and uh, you know what type of uh, respiratory uh, um, 
inhalation might be going on, blah, 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 and all the rest of it. So to answer your question, Charles, there is comparable. Um, and it's driven because a lot of people don't have access to healthcare in general. So we ensure that when they come to our projects, that they are given a thorough medical check over. They have access at any time. They can. They have facilities to go and see the doctor. They have uh, colonies. They have work camps, and have access to doctors and nurses, which are uh, there full time to look after their needs. Well, um, just a, another curious question from my side, uh, especially touching on. Um, the innovation and, and competence that you uh, that you mentioned at the end of your presentation, Mike. Um, mm. I was just curious if you've looked at using um, virtual reality for um, uh, nozzle men certification or something uh, similar, because I think certainly at our BTSYM conferences, we've had presentations from Edward uh, who have been working on turning a bit of that nozzle men training and certification um, to to a virtual reality based um, based approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I say is that we're, we're slightly behind on this, and um, and we're going to catch up. But everything we we're trying to do, in, and I hate to say, in in line, uh, obviously the the pandemic has thrown us completely out of kilter slightly. But there's a positive. I think in like us on on Teams meetings and interaction across the world now. Um, but we're, 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 we are more approachable under uh, doing it uh, virtual reality in every aspect of it. And I think there's huge benefits. So to move forward on the question, yes, there is, this, there is this to go forward on and to undertake. And then we are very much driven on, on, the, on the learning program, not on so much on the training, but more on the learning. So because it comes back to, again, just showing somebody in a classroom is not is not learning. That is training. And um, so this is where you've got an option of using reality or virtual reality to take the first step and then applying it uh, in, 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 in real time. Sure. Um, being mindful of the time, but I think I might take a couple of more questions. Oh. And on that note, uh, First, I think there's a comment from uh, Donald Lamont, who's the chair of BS 6164 Drafting Committee, and he said, glad you find uh, BS 6164 useful. But on the topic of BS 6164, we've got a question from Cecilia, I think, um, and she asks, I'm responsible for the planning of temporary services inside a tunnel. Other than 6164, is there any other specification guidance about safety during construction useful for tunneling? I, I, I've got to be quite honest with you. Um, I don't know of, which is when you're saying, uh, Cecilia, when you're looking at um, the... I, I, I turn around and say is that by default, BS6164, generally around the world, is, is, is the default Bible. And um, the you would have to... Um, look up other aspects of it um, other than that. What I'm saying is that even here in India, there's very little on tunneling as regards it's very limited. And ironically, I've been asked to, to review the Indian standards for tunneling. So, but again, um, I'm in the process of doing that at this present time, along with others. It's not just not me, but in general, the Indian standards. But even I'm even referring to 6164. Um, I do not know of anything. The ITA um, are producing it. There's a, the American uh, Tunneling Society have very different ones, and you can look at Australia. Um, but you've got to really go to that country and then look at their specific um, pieces of, of uh, legislation or guidance. So, but I've generally felt over over the years. 6164 is the default. Thanks for answering that question. I think the final question, or I think it's a question of a light and narrow by Kemi, uh, is why do people, well, why do tunneling operatives have to wear orange PPE 
why aren't they wearing green? So I think something everyone's uh, wondered at some point. <laughs> um, well, to be quite honest with you, is it all depends what type of green. Uh, no, not everywhere. I work for Nishimatsu, and they wore green, believe it or not. Um, if you look at it in some places, they don't. But it's more to do with the identification. It's a lot easier. Uh, orange or, or lighter colours in, in the thing. You've got fluorescent strips, etc., etc. And it, it's come right. Orange becomes the default colour, um, particularly when you're working on big projects in the UK. If it comes under brackets under rail, orange is it because it's 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 reflective. You not the word reflective in the sense where it re rebounds back, but you can see someone who's orange but you're very difficult to find someone who's wearing green or dark green, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It could be yellow. It could be a brighter orange, you know. Well, that's, that's valuable information and, and a good answer to a curious question there. Um, but I think on that note, and being uh, mindful of the time, I will bring the Q&A to a wrap now. Um, I think we've missed a few questions, but we'll try to answer them, which I think we can answer them ourselves as British Tunneling Society because they're more about career guidance and so on. So we'll try to answer them after the lecture. Uh, on that note, um, I would once again like to thank you, Mike, for your time and sharing your valuable experience with us. And certainly thanks for also in order to TAIYM and IC London Graduate Students Committee. Uh, for joining hands on yet another uh, successful presentation with us today. Uh, but on that list of people who played a key role in um, in making this presentation possible, of course, we'd also like to thank Arsul Zedi uh, for actually connecting us with Mike uh, and making today possible. I do have a few announcements, but before that, uh, I would just like to inquire of Unsure if he wants to add anything there. Unsure? I mean, yes, uh, you, you will be giving the announcements for sure. So just a small point from my end. That my, thank you very much for such a wonderful, uh, knowledgeable and interesting session. Uh, you have covered uh, Heathrow is uh, one of, like you have already mentioned, is one of the most uh, important topic widely uh, uh, discussed across the world as a case study. So you did mention that and you have covered a lot many risk uh, posing uh, and tunneling. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you again. That's it. I, I, uh, I would just uh, kind of uh, just say thank you very much for everybody who's been listening. Um, it was a whistle top store. Um, <laughs> whistle. <laughs> it was a, a quick, quick uh, intro into it. I probably haven't covered as much in detail as I would have done because it's a huge topic. And um, just thank you very much for the invitation. And I wish you uh, uh, a safe uh, and, uh, you know, look after yourselves in this in this pandemic. And um, please, you know, whatever you do, stick with the precautions because uh, whoever's listening, um, even if you think you've had a vaccination, it's uh, the variant is uh, changing all the time. And uh, do not put yourself or anybody else at risk. Thanks, Mike. Once again, thanks for your time and uh, certainly wishing everyone the best of health.